Uh, just to put into context where we are, this is a snapshot of the biodiversity data capture course. I'm looking just at today here. And we've gone through everything up to this point. And now I'll begin with a series of topics related to data sharing standards, specifically the Darwin Core is what I'll talk about most. And much of this will be preparation for some exercises that we'll do after I'm finished speaking. I don't know, how much time do we have before lunch is supposed lunch to go at one? One, yeah. one. So I'll only get through the first introductory part before lunch. Okay, afterwards we'll come back and I'll, I'll continue. The introductory part is about data sharing standards in biodiversity. And the standard that I will talk about is the Darwin Core. Town showed um, a screenshot of a paper in PLOS that describes the, um, the initiative of the Darwin Core, its history and its purpose. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with the idea of preparing you to use the Darwin Core for sharing data and also to some extent using the Darwin Core in the design of your own data models. And I'll describe when to use it and when not to use it. I'll right now try to describe its capabilities. Darwin Core is a standard for sharing data and it consists of a set of terms, of biodiversity related terms. Terms like scientific name and genus and location. The idea is that with a good set of definitions for terms like this, if we share data in fields that share these Darwin Core names, we should be able to expect that the content of those fields is consistent between us. It's our language of sharing data. When we fill a scientific name field, we do it in the same way. So if you get a scientific name from me, you understand what it is. If I get one from you, understand what it is. And more importantly, if we put all our data together, the scientific name field consists of scientific names, not of different things. The idea beyond that is to try to be as specific as possible about what a given term contains and not to mix the meanings of the contents so that a scientific name doesn't contain only genus. Right? We're not going to use it for two purposes. We're going to use it for one purpose only. And in Darwin Core, we try to have enough terms, enough different terms, that you can share the data in a form as close to its original as possible. So now I'll look at some of those terms. The Darwin Core has in its documentation, this is the actual website. If you want to look at this, you can go to the Darwin Core website online, or if the internet is not functioning fast enough for that purpose, you can follow along or explore this same document because it was in the folder from your pen drive. So inside of JRS Biodiversity, there's a day one. And inside of that, there's Darwin Core. And inside of that, there's Standard. You see that? In, inside of that folder, it's called Standard, there is one HTML file called Index. And that's this page. So the entire Darwin Core Standard is on your machines now in that folder. And you can run this entire website from your machines as well. I'm doing it from my machine. You can see up here, I'm doing the same thing. It's running from files as opposed to off of the internet. Just in case. So now I'm going to go to the, what is probably the most common reference on Darwin Core, and that is this quick reference guide. This is meant to be the, the place that you go to try and understand what each of the terms means. And it's arranged by categories. We have a term index. And these categories separate the terms into different um, logical groups. I won't talk about this one at the moment. It'll become clear a little bit later. We have terms that are related to occurrences. Occurrence is the existence of a taxon at a place and time. It's this combination of things. So occurrence related terms are really about specimens or about observations. 
Material samples are specifically about like DNA extractions and things like that. Events are the time, place, and protocol under which data were collected. The event, the collecting or observing event. Location is easy to describe, it's where, where something was. Geological context is the paleontological descriptors such as the um, lith lithostratigraphic layers and things like that for paleontological collections. Identification is the relationship between the occurrence, what you found out there in the field, and the attribution of a scientific name to it. So this identification is the same in botany as a determination. It's how and what name was applied, and what methods were used, and what references were used. And then we have two other categories of Darwin core terms. They're separated by this dotted line, and that dotted line is meaningful. I'll get to it at some point, what the distinction is here. These two are categories of information that relate to specimens or observations to each other in the first case. So with that, you could do things like plant-insect interactions. This particular insect was found on this particular plant. You can relate them in that way. And the other one is a um, category for measurements or facts. It's generic. You can create the measurement that you want, such as the temperature at the time of collection which you won't find in Darwin Core, there's no such term. But if that's important to you, the measurement or facts uh, part of Darwin Core will allow you to say, I measured something called a, an air temperature. And the units for that air temperature were in degrees Celsius. And it was determined under such and such a protocol, by such and such a device. Everything about the acquisition of other information that doesn't have a field in Darwin Core. So these two really allow you to expand the Darwin core quite broadly. The reason they're separated by this dotted line is because they are so broad, it's difficult to try to put those into a, an Excel spreadsheet, a single Excel spreadsheet. Why is that? If you imagine for a moment that I want to measure air temperature, but I also want to measure weight. How do I do that? In an Excel spreadsheet, I need to have an air temperature column and a weight column. Now, if I also want to know what the units were, now I add a temperature units column and a weight units column. So I'm adding plenty of different columns into, the, into my spreadsheet, but now those columns don't have terms in Darwin Core. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. What I really want is a spreadsheet for all the Darwin core stuff that can be one record per specimen, let's say, and another spreadsheet for all the measurements or facts about specimens. We'll go into data structures and tables and why, you, why and how you would create structures separate for them, and it'll become a little more clear why these don't really fit in this category. Everything here is what we call simple Darwin core. Simple Darwin Core are all the terms that you can put into an Excel spreadsheet and share them, simply, with one record per specimen. Okay, so let's look at some of these terms. I'll go back now to the first set. The record, record level terms are terms that don't really fit in any one of these other categories. They're about the specimen or the event or the location or something, but they don't apply to any one specific category. The reference guide allows me to go to any one of those categories. I clicked on record level terms and it brought record level terms to the top of the list. You can see some of the others down below. Some of them have plenty of terms in them. One has only one term in them. So the record level terms, is this big enough to read or should I make it bigger? It's okay? Okay. So they begin with a bunch of terms that start out with DC terms colon, followed by some other name. So DC terms type, DC terms modified, DC terms language. These are terms that are adopted from the Dublin Core metadata standard. 
You'll find these kinds of terms associated with bibliograph bibliography references and all kinds of other things. In Darwin Core, we want to reuse those. Those are useful terms. We don't want to make our own terms for it, so we're going to use some Dublin Core terms in Darwin Core. Type tells us what kind of a record is it. In Dublin Core, there's a very specific vocabulary for a type of record. For our purposes, a physical object is one of those. So if we have a specimen in herbarium, it's a physical object. In our Dublin Core terms, type would be a physical object. There also is a Dublin Core type for um, moving images, and another one for uh, still images, and another one for sound. So if our records are about those kinds of media, we would change this type. And that way, when people see the record, they know, OK, this is about an image, and this one is about a specimen, and so on. All the rest of these terms are, are related in that way. They're very generic and could apply to any kind of a digital resource. In our case, we're applying them to a biodiversity resource. So there's modified. It tells us when the record was last modified. Because data in our realm change, because we, do, we add a georeference or we change our identification, our records are always changing in their content. And this allows somebody to see the last time that somebody made a change to it. Language says, what do we expect to be the language of the information contained in the record? It might be in French or Spanish or English or a combination. And then there's information about what rights are there held by the data owner. What, who is that data owner? What are the rights to access it? How do you cite the record as a bibliographic citation? And what does the record <coughs> really talk about? Is there something much more specific online somewhere? about the record. For example, your own web page that has more information than is shared in the Darwin Core. That's what this would be, DC terms references. Then we have a whole bunch of new terms here. You see there's no DC terms in front of them. It's because those are Darwin Core terms. Nobody else in the world created these terms for us. So we created them because we need them when we share data. And they include uh, fields or terms such as institution code and collection code, and a data set name, and who owns the owner institution code, and so on. So these are generic terms created in Darwin Core about records. And they serve the same kinds of purposes as those Dublin Core terms, but for biodiversity, because these are things we're interested in that the rest of the world isn't necessarily. So among these are some very interesting ones. Basis of record is in Darwin Core what type is in Dublin Core. So remember, this one allowed us to say that it was a physical object, whereas basis of record allows us to say what kind of a physical object it is. So I'm going to go look specifically at basis of record right now and see what it says. Look at its definition. So I click on basis of record, and I go to the brief information on the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide about it. The important thing is this definition in its commentary. The definition says it's the specific nature of a data record. It's a subtype of that Dublin Core type term. And the recommended best practice is to use a controlled vocabulary when you fill that field. And then in the comments, it says here are some examples. Preserved specimen, living specimen, human observation, machine observation, and there are some others. So this is, these are all, not all physical objects. Some of them are physical objects, but we're being much more specific. It's a preserved specimen as opposed to a fossil specimen as opposed to a living specimen. Because in biodiversity, informatics, if we're trying to collect information that's relevant to us, we want to be able to distinguish those records a little bit more than we can with the, than with the Dublin Core term that only tells us a physical object. Okay? Okay, so go back. Now let's go a little bit more through the categories and so on. There are three other very interesting record level terms here. 
that already, based on some of the conversation that we've had, will be interesting to talk about. The first one is information withheld. That is a way for the institution who is sharing the data to say, look, we've given you this record, but we have more information that's not shared. Maybe it's location information about an endangered species. I'm not going to keep the entire record hidden just because it's an endangered species. I'm going to tell you my collection has endangered species in it, but this particular record keeps all the location information hidden. It's not shared. And I can tell you that here. That means that a researcher who's a valid, has valid claim to be able to use that record knows that you have that information and can go and get it without it actually having been shared if that's the policy of your institution. Okay? So records can still be shared and parts of the record kept back. And this is the way to tell people what you've kept back. Data generalizations is a little bit similar. That might be a description of how you have done something to the original data to put it in a form that's shareable, but not exactly as it was to begin with. Again, for endangered species, you might want to say which state or province that something came from so that people can create checklists for your endangered species, but you don't want to say exactly where it was. So in your data generalization, maybe all of those endangered species were georeferenced very, very specifically, and you have really good georeference information. You could say, the data generalization says, I'm only giving you the latitudes and longitudes to the nearest degree. You can put it on a map, but that's not really where it was. And along with that, I would say, I have withheld the very detailed georeferencing information. And this is what I've done to data that I have shared. And then finally, very different from those two, is a term called dynamic properties. Dynamic properties is a way for you to share any information about a record, even if Darwin Core doesn't have a field for it. I'll look at that one briefly for a moment, because one of the things that people, when they encounter Darwin Core to begin with, one of the things that they feel is, well, Darwin Core is nice for sharing, but I can't really share everything I have. I have really, really important information. Every researcher is going to want it, but I don't have to wait. I don't have a field for it in Darwin Core. So what good is Darwin Core? This is the answer to it. This allows you to share anything. And the way that you would do it is to create a list. It says a list concatenated and separated. Show, we'll see an example in a moment of additional measurements, facts, characteristics, or assertions about the record. And it's meant that you should provide this information as key value pairs. So the comment says, gives some examples. So in this field, dynamic properties, you would put something like the tragus length in meters equals a value. So you've given what the measurement is, you've given the value. Now you've got another one. This whole list between quotes right here, is the value of dynamic properties. So what I've done is I've given you two dynamic properties, a tragus length in meters and a weight in grams. And I can do that with whatever, any fields I want. Okay, so this is one way within the, the Darwin Core standard itself to expand its capabilities and share anything that you want. There are other ways to expand the capabilities of Darwin Core. I'll go into that in a minute. It's especially useful for uh, sharing, for example, image information, which is going to be very important in our discussions here. Are there any questions about that much? You see how I'm navigating through the Darwin Core site, looking at details, going back to the 